Let's talk about Eli's for a minute. Uh, I actually got my start into the career um, as a UI developer, a front-end developer, UI developer. Um, and I actually got into software engineering by getting into native desktop development. And it was really instrumental to my career because I feel like as developers, we're frequently removed from the end user client. And sometimes when we're pro programming really, really tough problems, uh, I think it's really, really easy to forget who we're coding for. So with that being said, uh, uh, I've had like a lot of different uh, experiences in different kinds of businesses in tech, and uh, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen uh, companies who ran entirely on TDD with no form of QA, and the product was just terrible. Um, I've also seen uh, companies that had absolutely no kind of testing, uh, except for nothing but QAing, and uh, I'll tell you, the, the product didn't work, but they had business anyway, so. I've seen a lot of things, but I've come to the conclusion that uh, UIs are becoming increasingly critical to the success of applications. I mean, there is an increased importance for applications GUIs to create a rich, intuitive, and uh, pleasant user experience. And with that, there's also an increased importance on validating and guaranteeing uh, quality assurance for uh, event-driven applications through the active process of exploring an environment. And uh, I, I say this because there's actually different kinds of testing uh, when we're talking about testing uh, app UI and applications in general. Uh, so I like to refer to this pyramid uh, where the topmost part is black box, oop, sorry about that, going back, black box testing, and uh, the bottom part's white box testing. So let's start with white box testing. Uh, white box testing is testing how the system functions. What this means usually is that developers end up writing these tests because we have knowledge of what's exactly in the code and we write tests based on the code itself. And uh, as we get kind of further up, uh, we go to end-to-end -to -end testing and you'll see that there's kind of a crossover for quality assurance uh, for generally like queuing engineers and the thing about that is that it's mostly black box testing and it differs from white box testing because white box testing is, does this algorithm work? Uh, if I put in these inputs, do I get out these inputs? Uh, black box testing though, uh, tests for the behavior and the functionality of a, soft, uh, of a particular software. And usually this is done without uh, too much knowledge of the code and it can be done manually uh, by hand or it can be done with automation through scripting. So we're going to backtrack to about two years ago. Uh, I got into Tornado FX, which is a Kotlin framework for Java FX. And uh, uh, I used a lot of like, uh, I used to program a whole lot of little programs to do jobs for me that I didn't want to do, and it used to get me in trouble quite a bit because uh, people thought I was just being lazy, and the answer, I, I was being lazy. Uh, so fell in love with it, but I kind of started running into some really nasty UI bugs, and the thing about those nasty UI bugs is that sometimes the application doesn't even crash. Sometimes there's no error. You're just not getting the behavior that you want. So I got to the point where I was like, okay, I feel like I can't debug this. Uh, the only way I can really get to this is if I figure out how to do UI tests. And the problem was I didn't know how to do that either. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm using uh, metaprogramming to basically generate solutions that I don't want to uh, write myself. So what if I use metaprogramming to write UI tests? And that's what I set out to do. Uh, the idea was pretty simple, sort of. I, the idea was that I would have an external application and you would be able to upload a Tornado FX application or project like the source code itself, it would scan and analyze those images and uh, basically locate the UI nodes and from there generate uh, some simple UI tests. All right, we're going to revisit this uh, pyramid right here. We talked a little bit about the differences, the differences between black box testing and white box testing. I like to consider uh, UI testing a little bit in the middle. 
Uh, it's a bit of a gray area because uh, with the methodology that I went in particular, I was using a framework called TestFX, and the idea is, okay, well, we have these nodes. We can grab some of these nodes, perform an action with them, and then there would be robots that would uh, basically interact with the environment. Okay, so I gave kind of a quick explanation on what this project was, and it led to a whole lot of conversations with a lot of fellow QA engineers and data scientists. And uh, I uh, kind of got to a point, to be honest, where I was like, wow, I'm like generating like not very smart tests. They're very dumb tests, actually. And uh, uh, it kind of like led to this question where can AI truly automate testing to validate the human experience? And I mean, let's, uh, has anyone ever like worked with like QA engineers or testers on their teams? Okay, so a couple folks, but if you never have, um, they can be really, really valuable for your team. Uh, some of the things that testers do, they uh, look for missing concepts, uh, they look for like groupings by commonality, uh, often they'll like look for inconsistencies or ambiguities. Um, or like uh, contradictions for the use of an application. So the, the point is, testing is meant to be a design activity. There's always going to be a human component to it. And uh, what I've also seen in my career is that uh, there's a tendency for folks to want to go immediately to programming as a solution without thinking about the actual answer first. And uh, so I, I, I'm sure like all of you have seen that a lot too. Uh, but in this case, I feel like people have a tendency to jump towards AI. Like, oh, AI is going to uh, replace the tester's job. AI is going to validate the human experience. Uh, it's going to do all the manual work and labor that uh, we would have to hire Q, QA folks for. And uh, the reality is um, AI is not very smart. <laughs> uh, I like to describe AI uh, like that scene from Family Guy where uh, Peter figures out that if he's a smoker, then he can take breaks from work, and then he doesn't have to work, and his boss uh, goes, Peter, you're not a smoker, and he's like, yes, I am. So he, she asks him to prove it, and he's like trying to figure out how to smoke, and he doesn't really know how, so he's like gauging Angela's reactions to try and figure out how to smoke. So I. AI is not very smart. It just uses a bunch of weights and training to be able to make some decisions, but they're not really making decisions themselves. So that's, uh, I feel like, uh, not, it, that's the big reveal. And thank you for coming to my talk. I'm joking, there's a lot more to this. Okay, so with that being said, uh, I do want to come back to my project and uh, talk about some interesting mechanisms that I discovered while working on Tornado FX Suite. And I found that uh, there is such a thing as neural networking and metaprogramming, and that it can definitely serve as a suitable option for certain, automatic, uh, certain automated techniques in testing. And I found that in uh, one particular case, and actually I'm working on another theory right now, but I found that they're more efficient. Uh, it actually requires less data for analysis, and there's far fewer unknowns with internal operations. Actually, I was considering using uh, TensorFlow to maybe like uh, uh, make my project a little bit smarter, but after doing a whole lot of research, I didn't really feel comfortable with <laughs> feeding in a whole lot of data and uh, kind of just letting it go and sending it into the unknown. But we'll definitely get into those mechanics too because uh, I have to say uh, it, didn't, it definitely didn't fit the requirements for this project. So let's talk about um, neural networking in deep learning versus neural networking in metaprogramming. So I want to say that for the sake of this discussion and actually uh, not just for the sake, I, neural networking in AI and neural networking in metaprogramming is actually isomorphic to each other. Uh, so I like to think about neural networking and deep learning as uh, 
it's the algorithm, it's the model itself. Um, and what this really means is that uh, the algorithm is always feeding data through the different layers, and it's always moving, it's always growing, and it's always refining itself. So I like to think of neural networking and AI kind of as like a, an action, always like a moving, a moving a, a verb, if anything. And uh, neural networking and metaprogramming uh, actually creates the model. Uh, itself. So neural networking and metaprogramming is, as opposed to is doing. Um, and in metaprogramming, these relationships uh, are drawn and patterns are created um, in order to solve some of the same problems that AI sets out to solve. Water break. Should have done this before. I apologize, I burned my tongue with coffee. All right, okay, great. So we've talked about how neural networking and metaprogramming in AI are isomorphic to each other. So since we've established that, let's go ahead and talk about uh, maybe some comparative analysis because I can't just say some stuff and then leave it at that. Uh, we're gonna continue on with this. So uh, there's actually uh, different kinds of neural networking and what made the most sense was to narrow it down to supervised learning, which is ex incredibly relevant to automated testing in general because generally with automated testing, uh, you're asking questions like, uh, well, does, does, the, does the application work? I mean, that's a very general question, but the more you dig down into those questions, you always have a target that you're going after. So we're gonna focus on classification uh, where the target is discrete, and what this means is, oh, what, what classification means is neural networking's ability to draw lines around dots in order to be able to separate and group them into clusters. So, uh, the kind of problem that classification would definitely fit for uh, automated testing would be locating UI nodes. So uh, there's actually an incredibly popular neural networking model uh, that's used to classify, uh, here we go. It's actually white box testing and the intention is that you would use your classification neural networking to be able to recognize certain nodes. It's called a convolutional neural networking. And uh, like I said, it's actually one of the most popular uh, models for being able to recognize these elements. Uh, it's been published in many academic papers. I think eBay also uses it, or at least they've uh, used it in some, some of their teams. And uh, the idea is that you have matrix math that flattens the pixel data as they pass through hidden convolutional layers, but it's also possible for these neural networks to also have uh, this particular model to also have non-convolutional layers. Okay, all right, so uh, I thought it would be kind of brutal to just talk about proofs in math, uh, so I was kind enough to uh, spend a whole lot of time trying to dig under the hood. I, one criticism that I personally have for AI is that it, it comes back to the whole feeding in data and just letting it go. I'm like, what do you mean? What happens after you feed it through the tensors? What are even tensors? And I like to think about, uh, I mean, tensors are specific to TensorFlow, but generally when we're talking about uh, layers, we're talking about filters. And uh, in this case, like part of your neural networking for convolutional layering uh, has like a set of filters. And when you're feeding your data through these filters, what you're essentially doing is actually breaking it down into, you're breaking your data down into something that your filters can process. And what it is is just a whole lot of pixel math. Like so much pixel math, and it's actually very simple operations. It's just there's so much of it that we can't, you know, do so many of them in our heads. All right, so we're applying two filters uh, of a three by three set to a particular image. And uh, the idea is that you take like the sum product of the first two filters. And then after you do that, um, you end up like actually reducing the size of the image. And uh, from there, you end up creating more images and then you take like a three by three by two filter and 
that gives you your resulting layers. And after that, it takes like the maximum for your four matrices, uh, for the resulting filters. And then there's actually a little bit more to that because uh, that's just really like the first part. That's like the main mechanism of convolutional uh, filtering. But then you also have to like feed the results um, through basically max pooling and uh, feed them through a dense layer, which also needs like a random weight. And then you take like all these random numbers and multiply them by corresponding uh, sum products. So there, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in, under here, but this is, at least for convolutional neural networking, this is what happens when you feed in data and you just let it go. There's a whole lot going on here. Okay, so this is the locator mechanism for this particular kind of model. Uh, I think it's important to kind of like uh, point out at the, that a lot of this is purely white box testing because there's absolutely no knowledge of what's in the code at all. But there are some uh, weaknesses with this kind of uh, neural networking model, uh, particularly if you have uh, certain elements that might be custom, uh, so they're not maybe like traditional like text boxes or maybe they're not a traditional image, or on, uh, you might not be able to recognize those custom nodes. But another issue that you can see that, you, that we end up running into is that if your nodes are partially covered for like any reason at all, it might not recognize it correctly or it might not recognize it at all. So those are some of the weaknesses. Uh, eBay claims that they have a 99% accuracy, but I didn't see any numbers or proofs behind that, so I'm a little bit uh, taking that one with a grain of uh, salt. Okay, now uh, we're gonna compare what we just saw with uh, the mo metaprogramming locator mechanism, this is something that I came up with um, in my own project. And it's actually kind of funny because I ended up using uh, abstract syntax trees to draw lines around the shape of the written language parsed. I actually gave a talk earlier today uh, talking about AST parsing and how it got me into my new job. And now I'm working on Arameta and the Kotlin compiler because Really, the abstract syntax tree can be grabbed uh, basically from early stages in the Kotlin compiler. So instead of drawing images around uh, the filter, sorry, instead of drawing images around the nodes themselves and like what you view on the screen, you're drawing, you're drawing lines around the shape of the intermediate representation that comes from analyzing the code. So when that happens, then you end up with these nodes and a lot of these nodes, they're like higher fragments. These are lexer tokens. And uh, it's, it basically gives you everything that reflection and, uh, reflection and PSI couldn't give you in Kotlin. So I was really grateful for that because when I tried looking through reflection and other metaprogramming capabilities, like there just wasn't anything. So I ended up finding uh, this library that was a wrapper around the Kotlin compiler. And from there, I was actually able to iterate through the intermediate representation. And I basically created like a dictionary to locate the nodes that I care about. So for example, if I'm a user and I want to write a test for some uh, form, I'm probably interested in the text fields. And I'm probably interested in the buttons. Very simple things. But you could add on to that definition over time. So, from here, I, uh, this is like actually some example code from the Tornado FX framework. It's uh, very simplistic, and I love it, actually. It's a very beautiful, beautifully written system. Uh, no code required, and that's how I like it. Uh, so if you're in a view, and uh, actually I had to like write in configurations. So on top of AST parsing, I had to write configurations for uh, Tornado FX specific things. So uh, if I detected that I'm somehow in a view and I found a root, then I'm able to recursively iterate down until I find the particular fields I want. And then I save them in a digraph structure, uh, which is short for directed graph. And this is what it looks like underneath the hood. So when you're like scanning the, the code, uh, this is like kind of how it's building up over time. And since we have that dictionary talking about the nodes that we care about, uh, these are 
the pulled out nodes that we have. And from there, uh, the next part isn't very uh, smart or anything. This project was full of dumb ideas. But we uh, would basically use string concatenation to generate really simple tests. I mean, they're really not great. I mean, it's like test, tax field, you write something, and then test button, you write something, and you click a button. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, even though these uh, tests aren't, pretty, aren't very smart or help, super helpful, uh, I think we have to come back to, can we automate tests? And truly, I, we can't write like tests the way that a developer can. I mean, that's still like a human component that automated testing could never fill for us. But I think having a baseline to start somewhere, I think, is a great place uh, I think we got through that whole video. So in this case, it was kind of nice because one test did fail and it did reveal no, no pointer exception. Uh, I thought that was kind of a nice find from that, uh, even though, you know, as a developer, I'm like, oh, I'm never going to run into that, but the test exposed it. So very simple test, not great. Um, I like to think of this as like hot dog, not hot dog situation. It's like that scene from... Silicon Valley, where they create some uh, AI thing where they scan like some food and it could detect hot dogs and then they scan like a pizza and it's like not hot dog. So that's where this product's at. Uh, regardless, I think there's some uh, pretty solid work behind the whole metaprogramming locator mechanism. Because uh, we can come back and like compare these two things and the amount of work that it takes to do each. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the AI locator mechanism, uh, this is big O notation, so no constants are involved, one, two. I didn't even go past uh, the original convolutional filtering, uh, mainly because we can already see that it's already a whole lot more work in processing than simply iterating through every node in your tree recursively. And the reason why this is MN to the third, uh, the M, I believe, is the number of filters that you're working with. And then also N is uh, basically your matrix math that you're repeatedly doing some products for. OK, so uh, I do have some future work. Uh, I'm hoping to get over to the regression side of analysis. It's kind of a work in progress. Um, I ended up getting really busy. Uh, with this new job, actually, it was kind of funny because when I was ready to get to this point, uh, I was an Android developer at the time, and then uh, the whole team quit. And I'm like, oh, OK, Man maintaining the whole base. And time, time can be crazy. So in any case, this is a work in progress. And I'm really hoping to get to this section because I think this would further solidify um, the idea that uh, maybe we shouldn't jump to AI immediately for everything. Um, also, I think uh, personally, like I, we just have to consider like uh, keep it simple. So if you're just trying to solve a problem, please just try to solve that problem. Like don't hop to the newest uh, technology. You know, you don't want to use Kubernetes just because you have a monolith. Um, because sometimes, like I see folks create Kuber uh, Kubernetes, like microservice thing, and then they create the same monolith but with more overhead. So uh, the whole point of this conversation is. Uh, I think it's great to just think about the solution that we're trying to solve. And uh, if it happens to fit your requirements, that's great. But if not, uh, it might be useful like looking into other things. So with that being said, uh, regression is different from classification uh, because we talked about how classification uh, is judged on the ability to draw lines around the dots and cluster them. But regression testing is actually more about uh, creating relationships to those lines. So uh, in this particular project, the work that needs to be continued is making these UI tests smarter. Um, and uh, I think one of uh, a question that we can ask is, uh, how can we increase the combination of permutations of interactions? So if you think about the job of a QA tester, um, I used to have one on my mobile team, and uh, it, it, I respected her job. I couldn't do it myself, but uh, she would spend about 
th two or three days doing regression testing, meaning she would test every possible case of interactions. It's a lot of work by hand, but uh, I think talking about you know how can we automate tests so that we can focus on uh, permuta or automating permutated uh, interactions because frankly we can't cover all of that ourselves. And while I'm like, you know, uh, AI doesn't solve everything, that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily against automation. I think automation actually should help you do your job, but it's not going to do your job for you. It's going to help you do your job better. So uh, this is what I would like to continue to work on. Uh, this is actually uh, the bit that I was looking into at the moment. Uh, so I already have a uh, parsing analysis from my AST, and I ended up creating digraph structures that not only contains information about those nodes, but it also contains information about the class breakdown too. So the idea that I'm kind of working on is that it would, pro it would be nice for me to be able to somehow create finite state machines uh, sort of from taking the information I already have and then doing further post-processing on it and uh, figuring out things like adding more information to uh, the, the structure that I created for things like uh, associated functions, uh, functional composition, which would basically be kind of a call stack. Uh, a lot of this like almost feels like the work of a compiler. We start with the AST parsing, we create our own definition, and then, uh, then we do further parsing to get more information. So. I feel like there's a lot of parallels to that in my studies with the Kotlin compiler. Uh, and I uh, started looking into some of the artificial neural networking. Uh, there's like s <laughs> so many papers, they're like 40 pages long. It's crazy, it's crazy um, complicated. Uh, the idea though is that you have an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. No one knows what's really happening here, but I intend on finding out. Uh, your input layer is mostly concerned with um, uh, starting to feed through your images, and then uh, you're not feeding through your images, you're feeding through uh, like how your tests perform, and then you end up uh, comparing like how they do over time. And then there's like f more things going on. Actually, I read somewhere that artificial neural networking is like based on the brain, and then I thought, well, it's 2 a.m., so I'm really tired, and I think I should go to bed, because I don't... This is, t I don't know why they're talking about brains all of a sudden, uh, but that's what I saw frequently. So then there's like two other things I wanted to point out. Uh, there's actually uh, some other things going on too when you're feeding through the layers. You have forward propagation, uh, which I do know is about O, N to the four time. And then you have backwards propagation, which is like responsible for training and tightening the network, which is about O to the N fifth power. I haven't even gotten to the actual meat of uh, the comparison, and I already know that it's a whole lot of work. And I do know that what I have here, I'm only uh, doing analysis, which to be fair, like I'm iterating at not a very efficient time. It's probably into the second and to the third in order to get the functional associations, um, the call stack that I'd like to look for. And, uh, but the point is there's a lot less information to go from. And we have five minutes. Is that five minutes for talking or questions or? Okay, all right. Well, I have like, cause I wasn't sure if I was gonna get through it or not, but um, uh, we could do a recap and then I can show you some of the ideas that I had about um, the functional association and functional composition if anyone's interested. Uh, I mean, not that anyone would like volunteer, so we're just gonna go through it real quick. Okay, recap. Using automation can help the tester, but it doesn't replace the role of the tester. Um, neural networking and metaprogramming is isomorphic to uh, AI uh, neural networking. AI uh, models for regression and classification is incredibly expensive and difficult to maintain and wrangle. And uh, I think really the whole lesson of this entire talk is you don't always need like a sledgehammer for a nail. So just some thought provoking things. Uh, if you guys would like to validate some of the things that I'm saying, I have some sources. Uh, the Tornado FX Suite was a project that I was working on. Uh, actually, there's quite a bit of automata and data science research, which uh, I just hold in repos. 
Uh, a lot of them contain like academic papers, um, mostly academic papers, uh, but I, I'm sure there's some other stuff in there too. Oh, also, uh, if you want to see me uh, tweet about like the Kotlin compiler or uh, the work I do on Arameta or see my previous uh, work on metaprogramming in Kotlin, I also write on Medium too. Thank you. I guess I could just, we'll just send it there. <laughs>